Can you hear me in the back? Welcome, welcome to our first Frontiers of Science lecture for the year. Yay! The Frontiers of Science lectures are, are uh, presented by the College of Mines and Earth Sciences and the College of Science, but we're really fortunate today to be collaborating with the, the Salt Lake Astronomical Society in, in putting on this event. So we have lots of members here. Let's give them a round. So it's, it's wonderful to see the this group, but we also have lots of students here, so that's also terrific. So we are honored and very pleased to have Dr. Kimberly Lichtenberg to present to us tonight some of the recent adventures of the Mars Curiosity rover. And we also have a prelude talk by Patrick Wiggins, who is going to talk about his most recent, I don't know if it's your most recent discovery, but it's the most recent one named after the university. Oh, I'm giving away, sorry. <laughs> but I didn't give away the title, sorry. I thought everybody knew, because I've heard that for so long. Okay, and what my job here is to introduce the person who's gonna introduce the speakers, and that is Roger Fry. Roger, if you'd like to come up here. Roger is the president of the Salt Lake Astronomical Society. He is uh, a professional geologist who worked uh, for Interwest Mining Company and also did independent consulting, I understand. Uh -huh. And now you've retired and right. you have uh, a tremendous passion for science outreach and for astronomy, I assume, since you're president Absolutely. of this society. <laughs> so without further ado, I'm gonna turn it over to Roger, and I wanna thank the society again also for participating in this. Thank, thank you. We're very pleased to partner with the University of Utah in this Frontiers of Science lecture. I'd like to start off by thanking the taxpayers of Salt Lake County uh, the, through a ZAP grant that we are recipients of. It made it possible to defray some of the travel expenses uh, with bringing uh, Dr. Lichtenberg to us to speak tonight. So we do thank the taxpayers for supporting the ZAP grant fund, Zoo Arts and Parks Fund. Uh, the Salt Lake Astronomical Society members uh, are a group of amateur astronomers that share a passion for viewing the night sky and astronomy. And as president of the Salt Lake Astronomical Society, I'm very pleased that we've partnered with uh, the College of Science and the University of Utah in this Frontiers of Science lecture tonight. Historically, the Frontiers of Science lecture has devoted the time to uh, speakers that are on the cutting edge of scientific discovery. Our partnership tonight has enabled us to focus in on perhaps the most exciting and ambitious exploration journey man has made in planetary science. Before I introduce the speaker, I would like to introduce our secretary treasurer, Patrick Wiggins, who has achieved a legacy in discovery in his own right. Mr. Wiggins was affiliated with the Hanson Planetarium for over a quarter of a century. He's retired from the Air Force. He is a NASA JPL Solar System Ambassador and currently devotes significant time studying the night sky, looking for asteroids, exoplanets, and supernovae. In August of this year, Mr. Wiggins received NASA's highest civil award, the Distinguished Public Service Medal, for his dedicated service in outreach in astronomy to the public. His hobbies include, in addition to astronomy, sports flying and, uh, and uh, skydiving with over 722 skydives under his belt, or is that 723 now? 722. One of the most recent uh, discoveries that he has made 
has special ties to the University of Utah, so we, I invite Mr. Wiggins to come up and explain uh, this and about his discovery. Mr. Wiggins. of students at the U. <laughs> what is in a name? Uh, you've all heard that before. Uh, I've been lucky enough, and maybe some would just say stubborn or uh, bullheaded enough, to spend a lot of time looking at the nighttime sky and actually found a number of minor planets, asteroids, if you will, and most recently, by the way, a supernova, but that's not for tonight. When you discover a minor planet, you get to name it. And since I've had a few to my name, well, the first one was several years ago with my then wife, Dr. Holly Faniff, uh, who, by the way, PhD from here at the U, yay for that. Uh, at any rate, she uh, and I got together, found the first one. We ended up naming that one for my hometown, Elko. Uh, we split up after that, and then the names for the other ones, uh, there was one she named for her new husband, and with my permission, by the way, uh, named one. <laughs> for her mother, I thought that was pretty good, and then KCPW decided they needed some money, so I gave them the naming rights to one, and one of their listeners actually paid $300 to be able to name, and so we did that. But a couple of months ago, I got word from the International Astronomical Union that they had numbered another of my discoveries, and that was it, 391795. It needed a better name than that, and so I was thinking, you know, I've been on the used payroll for like 20 plus years now, Maybe the University of Utah. Uh, talked to some people, Dr. Dutar, uh, basically a whole bunch of people up here, and they all seemed to think it was a pretty good idea. And we thought, okay, let's call it University of Utah. The Minor Planet Center has a very arcane way of naming things. And so they rejected it. And what they did finally approve just about a week ago was... <laughs> No spaces, by the way. Now, we did have to improve this, uh, so we, we kind of, yeah. <laughs> okay. So we've got University of Utah. A couple of things I get asked about this. Can you see it? Well, can you see the little dot with the arrows pointing at it up there? Very hard to see. It's only about a kilometer across, and it's out beyond the orbit of Mars. Matter of fact, this is kind of showing about, you can see here we've got the orbit of Earth, and down here we've got the orbit of University of Utah. Uh, my only fear about that, they see that it's so far away that one of these days they may decide to put a U parking place out there. <laughs> I don't think so. I can't take credit for that, but I, whatever. So anyway, right, that's basically it. University of Utah has a rock in space named for it, and uh, that's it. But now, I know you're really waiting to hear from Dr. Lichtenberg, right? So I'm going to turn it back over to Roger. Roger's got a few more things to say, and, and then we're going to hear a fun speaker tonight. <laughs> In that I'm a geologist myself, I am really like a child on Christmas morning at this time. I'm really excited about what we're going to hear tonight. But it's with great pleasure that I introduce our speaker this evening, Dr. Kimberly Lichtenberg. She is currently the instrument engineer for the SAM instrument on the Curiosity rover. She is also part of the uplink team that commands the rover on a daily to day basis making her job completely different each day. Kimberly received a BS in engineering physics from the University of Virginia and an MA and PhD in earth and planetary science from the Washington University in St. Louis, where she studied the origin and environments of hydrated sulfates in Aram chaos on Mars. In addition to being an advocate for space exploration on social media, Kimberly is a rabid fan of the independent Shakespeare Company in the LA area. She comes by interest in space honestly as her father was a payload specialist on the space shuttle Columbia SS STS-9 and Atlantis STS-45. Dr. Lichtenberg. make sure the mic is working. Is the mic working? No. no. Hmm. The mic, huh? Yeah. That's because 
Okay, better. Excellent. All right, let's tuck that in here. All right, well, first of all, I want to thank uh, both the University of Utah and the Salt Lake Astronomical Society for um, inviting me to come speak to you guys today. I am really passionate and excited about what I do, and I'm really happy to be here to be able to share it with you guys. Um, after I got invited to give this talk, I had a couple moments where I was trying to debate whether, what to focus the talk on. I knew I was going to write a brand new talk for you guys, and I wanted to make it fun and exciting, and also knowledge, like you'll learn something from it. Um, I thought about focusing it on the science that uh, Curiosity has uh, um, uh, we're done to date. Um, but I realized that uh, you guys can all go online and read all the press conference briefings um, that have way better explanations um, of the science, scientific discoveries that uh, MSL has made to date. What you can't get online is uh, the ups and downs of what the team has been going through for the last two years. Um, you don't get a lot of the insight into um, the challenges that we face, what it's like, uh, you know, operating a rover on Mars on another planet on a day-to-day -day basis. So that is why um, I am titling this talk two years on Mars, the good, the bad, and the ugly. <laughs> so uh, this is a, actually a very apt time to be speaking to you because Curiosity has just finished its prime mission on Mars, which is one Mars year or two Earth years. And as you guys know, this mission started on August 5th or 6th, depending on what time zone you're in, um, on 2012. And I know I remember very well where I was and what I was doing when Curiosity landed on Mars. And I'm sure a lot of you do too. But just to remind you about uh, where you were, I'm going to show you a little video. Unfortunately, it works better this way. Things are looking good. Coming up on entry. Get more reports entry interface. At this time, it'll begin pressurizing the propulsion system to increase the thrust of the system. Uh, we'll use that for all the maneuvering in the atmosphere we're about to do. We're standing by for guided start, start of guided entry. We're uh, beginning to feel the atmosphere as we go in here. The vehicle's just reported via tone that it has started guided entry. At this time, the vehicle is beginning to steer its way to the target. We have seen peak deceleration. Uh, it's starting its first next person. Uh, it is reporting that we are seeing G's on the order of uh, 11 to 12 Earth G's. Thank you, Marshall. Two is starting. We are now getting telemetry from Odyssey. We should have parachute deploy around Mach 1.7. Parachute is deployed. We are decelerating. Sea chill has separated. We're we'll have found the ground. We're down to 90 meters per second at an altitude of 6.5 kilometers per second. Standing by for back separation. We are in power flight. We're at an altitude of 1 kilometer per second. Standing by for sky green. Sky green is starting. You remain strong. Touchdown confirmed. We're safe on Mars.
cheesy, but it gets me every time. <laughs> Doctor, I was going to say, I believe that you had five rooms. Oh, did you guys? Fantastic. You guys are my people. That's amazing. So uh, something that uh, is a, a backstory to that video that uh, you guys won't hear about. Um, is uh, JPL, uh, anytime they have uh, any big event happening on lab, so an orbit insertion, a spacecraft landing, um, they videotape it. And uh, the videographer that we had at the time, this guy named John Beck, and he's, doing, he's done a lot of work for the Discovery Channel, National Geographic, he's a great videographer. Um, he was in the room filming, the room with all the, the people with the blue shirts that you're, you know, are getting really tense and then very excited. So he's in there and this is like one of the biggest events of his career. So he knows he has to get this right because if he's not videotaping it, there's not going to be any videotape of the guys you know, going crazy when we actually landed on the surface of Mars. Um, about 30 seconds before we know we're about to find out whether the uh, rover has landed successfully on the surface of Mars, his camera runs out of batteries. And he's sitting there and he's like, oh no, I have to get this right. He knows he has a spare battery, but it's in his bag on the other side of the room. And so he makes a mad dash for his, his, uh, uh, his bag, gets the spare battery, runs back to his camera, starts filming again about 10 seconds before we actually got the you know, touchdown confirmed, everybody goes crazy. So that is a, that's a story, you don't actually see him dashing in there, um, but, uh, but he told this story to us and it was just kind of funny to, to know that that, uh, that happened. So, I was unfortunately not in that room. Um, I was, I'm, I am part of the surface operations team. The team that you saw uh, in the uh, mission control there is part of the entry, descent, and landing team. And in NASA speak, that's EDL. We have a, NASA loves their acronyms. So that's the EDL team. Um, and the, the weird thing is that there's not a lot of overlap between the EDL team and the surface team. And in fact, we were in a completely different building on lab. So this is, uh, this is where I was, this is the room I was in. You can see that we were really afraid we were gonna starve that night. So we all brought food in. Um, and you can also see that uh, we have these big black shades uh, drawn, pulled over the windows, although there is, there's one that was not pulled down all the way, and I think that got fixed fairly soon. And that's because the surface team, for the first three months of the mission, we were working on Mars time. Now, what is Mars time? Um, a day on, Mar on Mars is pretty much the same uh, length as a day on Earth. Um, it's 24 minutes and 24 hours and 39 minutes. So if you think about it, uh, we are going to wake up, go to sleep, um, go into work, eat dinner, um, do our laundry on the schedule of a rover on another planet, which is actually kind of a cool thing to think about. Um, so what does this mean for the actual people who are working the mission? Uh, let's say you go into work at 8 a.m. one day. And uh, so the next day, uh, since we're on Mars time, we come in at 8.39 in the morning. And the next day after that, 39 minutes later. And soon, about two weeks later, you're coming in at 2.30 in the morning to, to go to work. So it was a, a unique experience. It was a lot of fun. I can tell you without a doubt that grocery shopping at 2.30 in the morning is the best time to go <laughs> if you happen to be awake at that point. Um, so it was a lot of fun. We got blue shirts too. I still have mine. Um, uh, so we're sitting here during landing. Um, we are eating our food and we're not looking at any of the telemetry that's coming back from Mars. So it doesn't really actually sink in for me um, that we've actually landed on the surface of Mars. I mean, I'm happy, I still have a job, it's you know, a good thing, um, but I, I'm kind of a visual person and I'm not looking at any of the data that's coming back from the rover until we got these. Now, we were told not to expect any pictures because we weren't sure how big, um, how strong the connection between the rover and the orbiting spacecraft that it was communicating with that was relaying the data back to us. We weren't sure how strong that was gonna be and whether we were gonna get the first pictures or not. As it turns out, we did. So this, was a, this is when I you know, yelled and screamed and got really excited. So Sol Zero, um, and I should point out that uh, this is one of the things that we've kind of done after 
you know, we've, we've been sending spacecraft to the surface of Mars for um, 40 years now. Um, and we learned pretty quickly that you get very confused when you have to talk about an Earth Day and a Mars Day. And so we made another name for Mars Day. We call it a SOL. So when you see SOL zero, that's what it means, is that this is the, this is the first um, Martian day of the Curiosity mission. So every Mars mission has its SOL zero, and they're all different. All right, so SOL zero. We have our front uh, picture from our front um, hazard avoidance cameras, which we call HASCAMs, and the picture from our rear hazard avoidance uh, 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 HASCAMs. And you can see that they, these look different than every other HASCAM we've sent back from, from Curiosity since. Um, we have a little bit of rounded corners here. You don't see those. It's, uh, it's kind of grainy and kind of dusty. And that's because these were taken with the dust cover still on the cameras. So this is a cover that was in place uh, to protect the camera lenses from anything material that got blown up from the surface of Mars uh, while the sky crane was lowering the, uh, the rover down to the surface. So pretty much after we, right after we took these pictures, we, we blew the pyros that flipped the dust cover off and it's never been down since. Uh, but you can see it was a really good thing that we did have this dust cover because you can see all the material that's on the cover. So that was a, that was a good thing that we had those. Something that I wanna point out though, is if you look right up here on this image, it's a little hard to see, but there's kind of a, um, a kind of a dark splotch right there. So remember that dark splotch, I'm gonna come back to it later. Okay, so we're on the surface of Mars. Um, why MSL? Why did we send MSL there? So before I get to the meat of the talk, I kind of feel like I need to give you some background. Like why did we send this rover to the surface of Mars? Why did we pick Gale Crater? And really, why are we going to Mars? So for, to, to explain this, I'm going to take you back to the 80s. And I'm talking about the 1880s, not the 1980s here. And uh, back in the 1880s, uh, people were using Earth-based telescopes uh, to look at the night sky around them. And a lot of them found this, this weird planet that kind of had this really funny orbit in the sky. And that happened to be Mars. And as their technology got better, they could see more and more of the planet. There was an Italian astronomer called uh, Giovanni Schiaparelli who was looking at Mars and making notes about what he saw. And he was uh, seeing some linear features that he called canali. In Italian, that word is channels. However, it got mis mistranslated into the English. And so when it came over uh, to America, they were translated as canals with all the uh, associated uh, subcontext of industry by intelligent beings. So there was an astronomer in the US, Percival Lowell, who uh, was building a, a, an observatory in Arizona, um, who was really fascinated, was following everything Scaparelli did, and uh, decided to make it his life work to study Mars. And he did, and he made this great map of Mars uh, with these linear features that he thought he saw and he called them canals, and he basically came up with this whole uh, uh, hypothesis that there were intelligent beings on the surface of Mars that had dug these canals. These were alien-made canals because the water was drying up on the planet and they had to transport water from wherever it was to their cities. And that was actually a very popular uh, hypothesis at the time. It was very exciting. Of course, you know, getting into uh, uh, as our technology got better, um, as we sent uh, uh, spacecraft to the surface of Mars, such as Vikings in the 1970s, it was revealed that there really wasn't any canals, no intelligent life. It didn't really look like there was any life at all on the surface of this planet. And public interest kind of waned, it died. Um, but the scientists were still very interested in exploring Mars. Um, it is uh, one of the closest planets to Earth. It is a little bit smaller, but it had the same starting materials uh, in the creationary disk. Uh, it started with the same stuff. Why does it look so different from Earth? So uh, when NASA got a little bit more funding and we decided to send uh, 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 um, more, uh, started to explore Mars a little bit more, um, uh, in the, in the, now in the 1990s, uh, we sent the Sojourner rover. So that's this little guy up here, about the size of a microwave, got wheels on it. And Sojourner was actually just a technology demonstration. I don't know how many people realize that. It was really just to see if we, we would send landers to the surface of Mars. And now I, I feel like I need to explain the, the different concept between rovers and landers. If it has wheels, it's a rover. If it lands on the surface and doesn't move, it's a lander. So Vikings were landers, Sojourner's the first rover. So basically, 
send it just to see if we could do it. Could we, could we actually drive something? You know, could we make something mechanical, you know, have actuators work on the surface of another planet? And as it turns out, yes, you can. So it was great success. It was awesome. Fired us up about you know, looking at the surface of Mars again. And uh, scientists started working on the next round of rovers, the Mars Exploration Rovers. So they built two of these. They figured uh, they got approval to build one. And then they were like, well, we could build two for one and a half times the cost. So let's do that. So we got two, which is awesome. Uh, so those uh, are spirit and opportunity. And now, uh, one of the reasons that we uh, sent spirit and opportunity to the surface is because around the time that we're building these rovers, we've also sent orbiting spacecraft to the surface or to orbit the planet that have some really neat instruments on them um, that can detect types of minerals on the surface. And one of the minerals that we detected on the surface back in you know, the 90s is hematite. And hematite forms in the presence of water. So this is a map of hematite. And you can see that this ellipse right here is Opportunity's landing ellipse. And uh, Opportunity's landing site here was chosen because of the presence of hematite. So Spirit and Opportunity were sent to follow the water. That was their mission. They were sent to find water on Mars. And they've totally done it. Um, but what tools did we give them to, to look for water on Mars? Um, we, if you think about it, these are kind of like our surrogates that we're sending to the planet. Um, if we humans had gone there, we would probably want to send a geologist, a field geologist that has some experience in the field so that they know what to look for. But we haven't been able to send a human to Mars yet. So we outfitted them like a field geologist. So what, a field, what does a field geologist bring with them when they go in the field? So bring a rock hammer. Because when you're going to look at rocks, as a lot of people in this room probably know, there is usually a weathering rind on the rocks that is formed when um, the rock interacts with its environment and it changes it. So in order to figure out what the rock really is underneath, you gotta kind of chip away the weathering rind to take a look at it. What they also bring is a hand lens. So this is something that you bring with you and it's, it's a lot like a jeweler's loop. And you, can, uh, you bring it to look at the phenocrysts inside the rock up close, the, the different types of minerals in there. And then you also bring a general camera with you to document the location of the rocks, the, the, um, the pieces of the outcrop that you're looking at in the wider context. So that's what we did with uh, Mars Exploration Rovers. So we sent um, what's called the rock abrasion tool. So that is to get under the weathering rind. We also sent a microscopic imager, that's our hand lens. And we sent the panoramic cameras. Uh, which is really our, our kind of uh, context imaging. And it also doubles as a spectrometer. It actually takes uh, more wavelengths than just the visible. Um, so that's pretty awesome. OK, so what's the next step, though? You're a field geologist. You're out in the field. You're looking at rocks. What do you do next? Well, there's stuff that you can't do in the field. So you take a chunk of the rock, you bring it back to your lab, you crush it, and you use it some analytical instruments on it, like x-ray diffraction, gas chromatograph, and mass spectrometry. But those are really big. So what we did is we made them really small. And basically, that is what curiosity is. So curiosity is the next step. If Mars exploration rovers are kind of the field geologists, Curiosity is the analytical laboratory that you would use in the next step. So this is actually a picture of the SAM instrument, and this is how big it is. It does everything that this thing does. So it's kind of an amazing feat of, uh, of engineering there. OK, so now we're getting to curiosity. I've given you a little bit of background of you know, why we're exploring Mars, what we've sent to Mars so far. So what do we put on curiosity? Um, it actually has a total of 17 cameras, and we have used all of them. They're great. OK, so um, our cameras, uh, the science cameras, are mass cam. Um, we also have chem cam, which is one of the most exciting instruments on this because it shoots a later laser, pew, 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 which I'm sure you guys all know and have seen. Um, we also have uh, our, this is our kind of microscopic imager right here, Molly. Um, our descent imager, Marty, um, which we occasionally still use, but it was mainly to capture the movie of, as we're uh, being lowered uh, via the sky crane. We also have a weather station, um, and we look for uh, subsurface water using the DAN instruments, actually looking for hydrogen. Um, we have a radiation detector, um, an alpha particle and x-ray spectrometer. Um, and this is not one of the science instruments, but I need to point out the fact that on the end of this arm here, this big massive arm, 
um, we have a drill. So this is the first thing that we've, we've, we have not sent a drill to Mars before. This is the first rover that has a drill. The other one has a kind of a grinding mechanism. But this is the first one that actually drills a sample, can collect it, and then deliver it to the analytical instruments, which are right here. So we have SAM. This is your gas chromatograph and mass spectro spectroscopy uh, instrument. And Kemin, which is our uh, X-ray diffraction instrument. So all these instruments were chosen so that we could achieve the prime science goal. Curiosity's primary science goal is to look for evidence of a habitable environment in a local region on Mars, either past or present. Um, there is not really one thing that you can point to when you're looking for a habitable environment. You find it and you say, hey, yeah, that's, that's, if we found that, that's a habitable environment. It is a lot of puzzle pieces that you have to put together. You've got to look at the biological potential of the region. You have to look at the geology and the geochemistry. Um, you have to look at the water history and the weather um, and any radiation hazards. Uh, this is the, the radiation hazards is specific to, to Mars because on Earth we're protected by the ozone layer and the Van Allen belts. Mars doesn't have a very thick atmosphere. It's a really thin atmosphere and it doesn't have a magnetic field. So the radiation environment on the surface is a lot harsher. And if we were humans on the surface, we'd have a really, really tough time with it. Okay. So uh, where do we send MSL to? How do we pick the landing site? Why did we pick the landing site? Uh, this is a map of Mars. You don't have to look at it too closely. It's just showing the locations of phyllosilicates, clay materials. And the reason we find clay materials so interesting, you know, other than putting them on our face and you know, face mask, is, uh, is that they're formed on Earth in the presence of water. And not just any water. It has to be... Um, nice water, it has to be warm water, it can't be too acidic, it can't be too alkaline, it has to be pH neutral. So uh, these are locations of phyllosilicates. We also see other hydrated minerals on the surface, but they're not shown here. But one thing that you'll notice is that they're kind of all, oops, that's not the way I wanna go. They're kind of all located in the uh, equatorial region of Mars. And if you look at a map of the landing sites of the landers and the rovers that we have sent to Mars so far, You'll notice that the majority of them are in the equatorial region too. And that's because we are following the water, we're following the hydrated minerals, we're looking for a habitable environment. So the scientists chose Gale Crater. And here's our uh, Curiosity landing ellipse right here. The next image I'm gonna show is uh, this box kind of blown up. And this is what we have seen in our, in our exploration of orbital data of Gale Crater. This is what we found, and this is what makes it so interesting to the scientists is that we see evidence of an alluvial fan uh, in the floor of the crater. And then in this uh, mound in the middle that we call Mount Sharp, and you're gonna hear me mention Mount Sharp over and over and over again. You're gonna get sick of it by the end of my talk. Um, we see evidence for a layer of clays, phyllosilicates. These are hydrated minerals. We see evidence for a layer of sulfates just above that. And then there's kind of a big uh, capping unit that doesn't show any hydration at all. Now, this mound is five kilometers tall, which is, a, if anyone's run a 5K, it's a little, it's like 3.2 miles. That is a lot of material to deposit. And because it's so much, because this is such a tall stack of sedimentary deposits, it had to have been deposited over a very long period of time. So this is actually, what we think we're looking at is a record of Mars's climate changing as we go up the layers of Mount Sharp. So this is pretty cool. So if that's true, what we're looking at here is the base of Mount Clay, so all the way back very early in the history, a warm, wet, pH-neutral environment. And then as we go to the uh, sulfate deposition, sulfates de get deposited here on Earth in acidic environments. So you have a lot of, and a lot of, and this probably also corresponds to a region of active volcanism on Mars where you're getting a lot of sulfur spewed out that's making the environment more acidic. And then after Mars loses its water, we have a whole lot of deposition of something that doesn't have hydrated minerals. Um, so that's why we're going, that's why Gale Crater and Mount Sharp are so interesting. It's basically the entire record of you know, Mars's climate history in this one mound. And another way to look at it, so this is um, uh, basically an orbital image that we've taken that is uh, draped over the shape of Mount Sharp. So you can see where the layers of the clays are, the layers of the sulfates, and the layers of 
what we don't find quite as interesting because it doesn't have any hydrated minerals and we're not planning to go there. We really just want to see the clays and the sulfates. Okay, so we've landed and this is really exciting. So what we, oops, uh, what we have here is uh, the Curiosity rover is in this little spot. Um, you can see where the back shell and the parachute landed. So these are all pieces of our entry, descent, and landing equipment. This is all stuff that we needed to take with us from Earth so that we could land successfully. And of course, they have to land somewhere on, on Mars. And we found them all. So uh, back shell parachute, the descent stage crash site, two new craters, and the heat shield. All right, so remember about 15 minutes ago when I was showing you those two, uh, the, the first images that we had from Mars and I told you to uh, look, remember that little smudge in the, the rear has cams? Okay, when uh, Curiosity landed, it landed facing this way. So the front of the rover is looking this way. If you look at the, the back where the back was facing and you trace it back, what do you see? You've got the descent stage crash site. And so, and we're pretty sure that the descent stage still had some fuel left on it. So when it crashed, it probably made a pretty big explosion. And that's what we think we see in those images. That smudge is the descent stage blowing up essentially when it crashes. So I, I find that pretty cool. <laughs> I'm an engineer, I like explosions. Okay, so, so this is also uh, one of the first pictures that we took um, after we uh, landed. Uh, we've driven a little way away from our landing site. We're looking back at it. You can see um, where the uh, exhaust from the sky crane thrusters has blown away the material from the surface of Mars. So it's exposed the bedrock. It's pretty much scoured it. And you can see basically that the rover looks like it just came out of nowhere. And this is the only, the only rover, a lander actually, that, that has this. Every other rover that we've sent to the surface of Mars has had a platform that they'd have to, had, they've had to driven off of. This just seems to have come out of nowhere. And I might be getting a little philosophical here, but I tend to think that this image kind of is uh, a parallel to the reason why we're exploring Mars with this rover in the first place. Kind of, you know, habitable environment, origins of the universe, life coming out of nowhere. This rover came out of nowhere. Anyway, take that with a grain of salt. Okay, so uh, we are getting to the meat of the talk now. So I've not been talking about really results of the mission, just giving you a lot of background. Um, we are now getting to the mission and the, and the meat of my talk. Okay, so we've landed. Um, something to notice about our landing site right here in the area around it is that we're landed very near a junction of three different geologic units and you can really see them here. So there's this one. There's this one, and there's this one. And so you can see the lines kind of delineating them right here. So this triple junction of where these three units meet, basically the geologists, and I'm not kidding, 400 scientists, it's like herding cats. They cannot come to an agreement, which is why we have a project scientist, because when they can't come to agreement, the project scientist just kind of takes out his gavel and you know, makes a decision. Um, anyway, so the scientists saw that. Now remember, Mount Sharp is our primary goal, which is way down this way. So we're supposed to be driving this direction. And I don't know how they did it, but somehow the scientists convinced NASA headquarters to say, we want to drive in the other direction to see this really cool place that may or may not have really cool stuff. NASA headquarters said, okay, so we went. So we're heading over to Yellowknife Bay. So now we're getting to the good part of the talk. All right, the good, the good is Yellowknife Bay. Remember, we're looking for habitability. We're looking for um, an environment where all the pieces of the jigsaw puzzle are there. I'm not kidding, this is like a jigsaw puzzle for, for scientists. You have to have evidence of water activity, and the, the, the longer the water was there, the better. And the reason why we're looking for water, I don't think I've made this connection yet, is that um, of all the various life forms that we found on Earth, the one thing they all have in common is that they need water. So water is one of the most important pieces of this puzzle. So we're looking for evidence of water activity. Um, we're looking for an environment that's uh, not too acidic and not too alkaline. So um, it's not battery acid and it's not lye. Um, it's something that you or I could drink. Um, uh, you guys might know that we have found life in very extreme environments here on Earth. We found them in, um, in the Rio Tinto, which is a very acidic river in Spain. Um, we have found them in hydrothermal vents, uh, but 
we think that life uh, evolved to uh, adapt to those environments. Um, what we're looking for here is an environment where life would say, hey, this is really this is a nice, warm, comfy, fuzzy place. And this, is, uh, this seems like a good place to, to start. Um, we're also looking for the key chemical ingredients for life. Now, I'm not a biologist, but a biologist would tell you that pretty much the key ingredients you need are carbon, hydrogen, oxygen, nitrogen, which is not on the slide, phosphorus, and sulfur. And then um, life might also need a source of energy. So another point to make here is we're not actually looking for life. We are just looking for a, an environment that existed on Mars that life would have been happy in. Okay, so we drive to Yellowknife Bay and we get this picture down from, uh, from the rover. And most of us are like, okay, that's a, that's a picture. And the sedimentary geologists go, oh my gosh. Because it has a conglomerate of rounded pebbles. Um, so what this, what this indicates to the sedimentary geologists that we have on our science team is, hey, there was water activity in here. There was something that rounded these rocks. And if you look at rocks in a very arid environment here on Earth, uh, where there is really no water activity, you don't see rounding. You see that the angular edges of rocks uh, pretty much stay preserved. You really need sustained, flowing, long-acting water activity. And we're talking ankle to hip deep here in order to get this kind of, uh, of rounding. So, hey, evidence of prolonged water activity. We drive a little bit further down the alluvial fan, and we see, oh, sorry, wrong slide. Um, we see this here on Earth, too. Uh, so the image I was just showing you is on the left. Um, this is an image from a, a dry uh, stream bed in the Atacama Desert. So this is a, a very similar environment that previously had water and doesn't. Okay, so we drive a little farther into the alluvial fan, Yellowknife Bay. Um, and find rocks that show inclined layers that indicate sediment transport. We also find with the ChemCam that we are seeing veins of a calcium sulfate, gypsum, um, percolating or, or existing in a rock. And we think these deposited by uh, water percolating through the rock and basically uh, precipitating out calcium sulfate in these veins. So that's another piece of the puzzle. Um, but these are all kind of uh, you know, geomorphic observations. Um, what is actually in this rock? What's the content of it? So we get out our drill, and this is the first drill that we did on the surface of Mars, so it was actually really exciting for us. Um, and so I just showed you a picture of the, the drill out. Um, so once we drilled, and this is uh, just a picture of the, the main drill hole, we did a little test drill hole just to make sure we could. Um, drilled the main drill hole, and every time we uh, drill, you know, we have a whole bunch of engineers on our mission, too, and we're kind of um, paranoid about the mechanical hardware on this rover because we can't fix it if it breaks. So we take pictures of everything. So after every drill, we take a picture of the drill bit. So this is the picture of the drill bit after we drilled. And then we looked at the material in our scoop to make sure that it was suitable to deliver to our analytical instruments. So this is what we saw with Kemen. Um, we had done a Kemen analysis on some sand that we had scooped up earlier in the mission. Um, and I, am, I can't read x-ray diffraction patterns, um, but this is the sand thing. Uh, and this is the John Klein drill powder. And apparently, uh, this um, ring here indicates phyllosilicates. So we know this is clay material. And actually, we're, we were pretty certain it was clay material as well because it was really soft rock. When you drilled into it, 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 it didn't take very long to drill into it. What did we see with SAM? So when we heated up the sample and analyzed the gases that came off, we got uh, carbon dioxide, uh, oxygen, sulfur, but the most interesting part was that we got water coming off at high temperatures, which is another indication of clays, in particular smectite minerals. So basically, if we put all the pieces together, we have a regional geology that has fine-grained rock, which suggests that uh, this site was the end of an ancient river system or an intermittently wet lake bed. The mineralogy indicates sustained interaction with liquid water that was, you know, nice, happy, uh, warm, not too acidic, not too alkaline, um, and not too strongly oxidizing. The key ingredients are present, um, and I have, and have, did not show a slide that shows the evidence for this, but um, presence of minerals in various states of oxidation um, would have provided a source of energy for primitive organisms. So, yeah, so not even a year into the mission, we've achieved our, our, our primary goal. So scientists are very happy at this point. So this is the good. This is 
Um, this is the greatest science, ach science achievement that Curiosity has made so far, but I hope it's not gonna be the last one. However, now we've done the good, we have to go to the bad. Um, and the bad actually happened while we were in the middle of this campaign at Yellowknife Bay. So I'll set the stage for you. It is Sol 199, we have drilled into the surface of the rock. We have delivered the sample to Kemen. Kemen has done their analysis. We have not yet delivered the sample to Sam, and the Sam team is you know, getting their instrument ready, checked out, making sure it's ready to do its analysis. And all of a sudden the team comes in and sees something in the data that came down from the rover that, they, that really worries them. Before I show you what that is, um, I need to show you what a normal power situation for a happy, healthy Curiosity rover looks like. So as a good engineer, I've labeled my axes here. I have power on the left, uh, time on the bottom. Um, and as you uh, go through, uh, um, actually I should step back and tell you a little bit of how Curiosity gets its power. Um, it has an RTG uh, in the back. And the way that this generates electricity is that by uh, natural radioactive decay of isotopes generates heat. Um, so we have heat uh, in the RTG. Mars is a very cold environment, and so we have this great um, dichotomy between the heat that's generated by radio naturally occurring radioactive de decay and a cold temperature. And basically, um, the, the contrast between those, we can generate energy from it. So that is where our energy comes. We also have two batteries on the rover uh, to store this energy. So we can take energy straight from the RTG to power the brain of the rover, to power the instruments, but we usually funnel it through the batteries. And the way we usually uh, talk about our, our power situation of the rover is by the state of charge of the batteries. Okay, so on a normal day, um, when we have the rover awake, so it's brain, it's like your computer, my, my laptop here is up and running, um, we have usually a couple of science instruments that are on all the time. If you just have the rover being awake and those science instruments on, you're not doing anything else, we are actually power negative, which means that we are drawing more energy from the batteries than the RTG can put into it. So that's why we see a negative line here. Then when we uh, are talking to the orbiters, so there are a couple of orbiting spacecraft that have uh, been, around, been orbiting around Mars for a couple of years, and we use those as relay stations. We can talk from the rover directly to Earth, but that takes a lot of power. And talking to the orbiters, which are a lot closer, doesn't take nearly as much power. It does take some power, but not as much. So that's how we usually get our information back from the rover, is sending the, uh, sending the data to an orbiter, and then the next time the orbiter is inside of Earth, it sends back not only its own data, but our data from the rover. So we have to have a very nice working relationship with those orbiter teams or else we're not gonna get our data down. So uh, these blue bars are uh, basically when we are talking to the orbiters above us and sending data. In between those times, the rover is recording what it's doing so it can tell us uh, during the times it's talking to the orbiter what it's been doing. So as I mentioned, those, kind of, those take a little bit more power so you'll see a little bit of a decrease in here. And generally, um, what we do at, at, at night is we sleep. Um, it's kind of like putting your laptop to sleep. Uh, uh, there are parts of it that are still powered, but it's not responding to any commands. Um, it is, uh, it's basically just kind of like primary life functions, like making sure that you know, nothing is uh, going out of bounds temperature-wise, kicking off heaters if it needs to. Um, and we do this so that we can recharge our batteries, because in those times, we are power positive. So this is what we expected to see when we got our Sol 200 downlink. This is what we actually saw. That's not good. That's really not good. So basically, it, and there's something else to this as well. So not only are we seeing the power decreasing and decreasing and decreasing, um, what we're seeing in the downlinks is we expect to see, let's say in this, um, in this time period when we get the data from the orbiter, we expect to see all the recorded data from this period and, um, and basically what we call real-time data, which is data that the rover is producing right now. Um, so if you think about it, it's kind of like uh, when you're saving something to your laptop, but then you upload it to the cloud all at once. It's kind of like that. It's like we're saving it on our flash drive, and it actually is a flash drive, um, on the rover, and then we're sending it to the cloud, which is our, our orbiter. Um, we are not getting any of the recorded data. We're only getting the real-time data. And that's really confusing. Usually you think if you get some data, you're gonna get all data. Um, 
So this was very puzzling. And it's also uh, very stressful because uh, if we don't have enough uh, power, we can't run heaters that keep the, you know, the, the main functions of the rover uh, warm and working. You know, electronics don't like to get, don't, don't generally like huge temperature differences. And we have really wild temperature swings. If you think it gets like the temperature difference, you know, in the desert gets, is, is extreme, think about Mars. Like it gets from 32 degrees to like, you know, minus 185. So electronics don't like that. So we try, we have heaters to basically keep it within a certain temperature range so that they'll last longer. So if we don't have enough energy to power the heaters, we're probably gonna start losing electronics. And that means we're gonna lose the rover. So we have to do something soon and we have to do something pretty drastic. Now luckily, um, a lot of the engineers at JPL are kind of paranoid. And we realize that we've been really lucky so far on the surface of Mars. All the rovers and the landers that we've sent before this have had one brain, one rover compute element. Why do we just send one if we can just send two? So this rover, they actually sent two. So we have two brains. We've been working on, um, basically it's called Rover Compute Element A, RCEA, and we have Rover Compute Element B, RCEB. So we've been working off RCEA. We haven't even turned RCEB on since we landed because we haven't needed it. A's been working fine. But we're thinking A's having a lot of problems right now. We might need to switch to B. So. We make a command decision um, to tell the rover to switch to B. Um, there's something else that I brought that I need to mention here, which is not only are we, uh, you know, kind of in this dire situation right now, but in about two and a half weeks, um, we have what's called conjunction, and that is when uh, Mars goes behind the sun and we can't talk to it for a while. And generally, um, we want the rover to be in a really stable, safe configuration because we can't talk to it for about three weeks. It's really only behind the sun for about a week and a half, two weeks, but we have a little margin on the end. We don't quite know when we're gonna be able to talk to it again. So essentially for three weeks, we need this rover to be safe and we need it to be basically autonomous. So we're not gonna be able to talk to it for three weeks. If anything goes wrong, it can't tell us and we can't respond to it. So we've got that deadline coming up too. So at 2.30 in the morning, the project makes the decision, okay, we're gonna to switch to RCEB. So we did. Okay, and once we did, we were able to kind of like ping RCEA and say, hey, what exactly happened? What's going on with you? Once we were assured that the river was safe, it was shutting down correctly, it was recharging. We, our, our best hypothesis, and we'll never really know, is that there was a catastrophic failure of our flash memory that resulted in the file system becoming unavailable. This is mostly likely due to corruption from high energy solar and cosmic rays. And this is actually um, a not unheard of event on Mars. It's happened to pretty much every single rover and lander that we've had. Again, Mars doesn't have the shielding that Earth has. It gets a lot more high energy particles at the surface. And although we try to make the hardware as, uh, as you know, radiation hardened as we can, you know, things still go through and get corrupted. So this is not unheard of, it does happen. Um, unfortunately, it happened to us in a very unlucky location of the flash memory. It's basically the table of contents. So um, we have task managers on the rover, just like you have on your laptop. And the task manager uh, did not handle this situation gracefully. This is something that we never anticipated um, in the rover. And what happens is that the task that controls the rover shutdown basically became blocked. So what happens in the process of proceeding towards shutdown is uh, you have a command that uh, writes all of the data that it's collected to, to flash memory. So we have RAM and we have flash, so it writes it from RAM to flash. But it has to know where to write it, so it has to query the file system in order to figure out a good place to put this data. It's querying the file system, but the file system is not responding, so basically that task doesn't have a timeout and it's hanging, and the task behind it is the shutdown task. So basically what we're going, at, we're going through, the task manager is like, all right, I'm writing data products. I can't write a data product. Okay, uh, I can't shut down then because I can't write a data product. So basically we were getting the command shutdowns in but they weren't actually happening, which means that we weren't sleeping, which means that we were not recharging the batteries, which means that we had to swap to backup computer. So, um, that was the SOL 200 anomaly. It was a couple weeks of uh, very, very tense uh, uh, round the clock work by anomaly resolution team, but luckily um, it, it ended up okay where we've been on RCEB since. 
Um, but there are a couple of other unintended, not unintended, but consequences for switching to the backup computers. Not only are we on the backup computer now, there are a couple pieces of hardware. Um, we also have redundant engineering cameras, um, and uh, they are hardwired to the different brains of the rover. So we have a set of engineering cameras that, that we can use when we're using RCEA. We have a set that we can use when we're using RCEB. Um, the ones that are particularly uh, interesting are the rear has cams are on completely different sides of the rover. And uh, this was not a huge deal, but it was, it was kind of frustrating getting the rover up and running after switching cameras because the way we drive the rover is the, the rover drivers, since we have stereo cameras, were able to make a terrain mesh. Now, what is a terrain mesh? Basically, think about laying a fishing net over, uh, over some ground. You've got some rocks and some hills, and then take away the ground. That is essentially your terrain mesh. It's basically a fishing net that the rover drivers put together to simulate the terrain and figure out how we're gonna drive um, uh, on the ground in front of us. So we've had to switch how to make our terrain meshes by using the new cameras. So it's, it's not a big deal. It's just kind of an extra like, oh, we have to do this now too. So um, we're back to being stable. We're healthy. We've been on RCEB since the SOL 200 anomaly. Um, we have basically lobotomized RCEA, um, gotten rid of the corrupted part of the flash memory so that we can use it as a backup in case anything happens to RCEB. So that's good. Now you're wondering, why is this not the ugly? It really should be the ugly. Um, but actually, uh, because we had a backup computer, we were never in really, really dire situation. It was not, uh, it could have been, but it was not an end of mission event. Okay, so now we're back to normal operations. We're still at Yellowknife Bay, we finished the drilling campaign, and we're booking it to Mount Sharp now. So remember, our, uh, our end uh, uh, state is right here. We wanna go to these layers. Um, so we're driving. And uh, as we drive, we take some really cool pictures. Uh, this was an image taken by the Molly camera. Um, the Molly is the one, remember, it's at the end of the arm, and the arm is usually stowed like this whenever we're not doing any arm work. And the interesting thing that I find about the Molly is we take essentially an end of drive image, but the Molly is tilted on the end of the arm. So basically, the Molly always is looking at the, the you know, things like this. So that's why it's a, a little off kilter here. Um, we also do fun things like take selfies. So we've taken uh, three of these on the surface of Mars so far. This is the second one. You can see where we've scooped here. But the way we do that is we're also using the Molly camera here. We stick the arm out and we take a picture of ourselves. Of course, we have to take a number in order to get like you know, the whole rover. But we get them all, we stitch them together, and we've got this really cool picture of our rover on Mars. We also see really cool things while we're driving. Uh, these are iron meteorites that we passed um, when we were booking it to Mount Sharp. And, let me tell you, there's a lot of dissension among the science team. It's like, do we go, do we stop, do we go look at the, oh, shiny, they're really cool, let's go look at them. But <laughs> the job of the project scientist is to say, no, no, we've still got Mount Sharp, we've got to get to Mount Sharp. And honestly, iron meteorites are not all uncommon on the surface of Mars. We've seen a lot of them with spirit and opportunity. So we took some pictures of it, drove right by. Okay, so we're booking it to Mount Sharp, we're driving as fast as we can. Now we're getting to the ugly. Wheel damage, I'm sure you guys have all heard about this. Okay, so uh, as you can see here, and in the image here, this is what a pristine wheel looks like. And um, I was actually really happy to see you guys coming up and touching the wheel, that's what it's here for. Come after Q&A, pick it up, take pictures with it, you know, crawl inside of it if you want to. Um, this, is, uh, this is the exact size of them on Mars, and this is what it looked like when we we're doing testing here on Earth. It's very pretty. This is what they look like shortly after we landed and we've driven a little bit. So you can see that they're, they're getting a little dirt on there. They're a little dinged up. Um, there's a ding here, there are a couple of dents here. We expected that. Um, we are, in all the testing that we've done on, our, on Earth with these wheels, um, they do get pretty beaten up. Um, but this part in between is not the weight-bearing part of the rover. Um, it's these grousers in between, it's basically the cleats of the wheel. Those are the weight-bearing. The stuff in the middle is actually really, really, really thin. It's, it's about three quarters of a millimeter thin. It's very thin aluminum. Um, and it's really just there to make sure that we're when we're driving in sand, to see it, we don't sink into the sand. Um, and it's also there to prevent um, material, big rocks from getting into the wheel and um, uh, jamming the actuator in there. 
So we expected some wheel damage. But around 463, we get a picture back that looks like this. And this is not what we expected at all. Um, uh, our lead rover driver, Matt Heverly, says when he saw this, his, his stomach kind of sank a little bit. So we, we expected some wheel damage, but all of a sudden we see that we're accumulating wheel damage at a w rate way higher than we, um, than we anticipated. And unlike the brains of the rover, we don't have a backup set of wheels that we can switch to. These are the wheels we've got. They've got to get us to Mount Sharp. So uh, the project said, okay, let's, let's take a look at this. Um, what we started doing is mapping all of the uh, dents and punctures in the wheels. We actually have a running database of every single hole in every single wheel, and about every 100 meters, we stop and take another survey of all of the wheels um, and compare and take a look at the damage. Um, what we discovered um, is that uh, between also looking at the terrain that we've been driving in to figure out why are we getting so much more damage than we anticipated and doing some additional testing on Earth is that it is um, very sharp pointy rocks um, that are embedded in the surface. And you would think that, yeah, okay, everybody knows there's sharp pointy rocks on Mars. Like, why didn't we anticipate this? It's actually not just the sharp pointy rocks. It is uh, the fact that this is an all-wheel drive vehicle. All the wheels are pushing at the same time. So in the front two wheels, um, if you're driving this way, in fact, let me just take this down. Okay, so we're driving this way. And in the front, the front wheel and the middle wheel, the axle is, is pushing this way. So you're not only pushing forward, you're pushing down. So you're actually jamming the wheel into the sharp rocks. With the back wheel, we actually don't see as much damage on those because as we're driving this way, the axis is here. We're actually pulling up a little bit. So we came up with two mitigation strategies, which we have been employing to great success so far. Um, one is to drive backward, actually, and the server is capable of doing that. So we do about half our drives backward now to, you know, that increases the damage on the rear wheels, but it helps out the ones on the front wheels. And then the other one is don't drive over sharp rocks. So, okay. Um, okay, so actually there's a, um, another video I want to show you. Let's see if I can find it. Uh oh, where'd it go? Just a second. Nope, that's not it. Here we go. I'm Ashwin Vasavada, Deputy Project Scientist. I'm Matt Heverly, a rover driver, and this is your Curiosity Rover Report. Curiosity has been on Mars for one Mars year. That's 687 Earth days. Our goal over that time was to find a habitable environment, and we did. We found a lake bed on Mars that we drilled into and found the ingredients and conditions that could have supported microbial life if life ever was on Mars. It hasn't all been smooth sailing for the rover on Mars. After we left Yellowknife Bay where we did our first drilling, we noticed that the wheels were taking much more damage than we had expected. Sharp embedded rocks on the surface of Mars were really giving trouble to our wheels. We think we understand what's causing those holes from a lot of tests that we've done here in the Mars yard and a lot of analysis of the terrain from our orbital images. One of the other things we've done here in the Mars yard to understand the wheel wear issue is we built a half of a rover that we're driving over the simulated terrain so we can watch how the wheels really wear. We think we've got new techniques to be able to drive the rover safely and identify some safe paths. Using our new driving techniques, we made it to a site called the Kimberley, where Curiosity drilled its third drill hole of the mission. We drilled into a site where water flowed across the surface and deposited a series of sandstones. We drilled into one of those sandstones, acquired rock powder, and fed it to our two analytical laboratories located inside the rover body. While the rover was at the Kimberley doing its drilling campaign, it even took some time to take a selfie. It reached out its robotic arm, just like me with my camera phone, and it used the Molly to take a series of pictures that it stitched together to take its self-portrait. Rover took a <coughs> selfie before drilling and after, so you can even see where it drilled a hole on Mars. As we drive from the Kimberley to Murray Buttes at the base of Mount Sharp, we tried to identify the best path for the rover. This means driving through sand. We took the Scarecrow rover to the Mojave Desert. Where we drove over similar sandy terrain to make sure that we know what's going to happen once we get there. The focus of the mission is really now on driving as we approach the base of Mount Sharp. 
In our first Martian year, we've driven almost eight kilometers in total distance with the rover. We get a little bit closer to the base of that mountain every day. Over the next few months, the science team is really excited to get to Mount Sharp, where we think the layered rocks there have captured the major climate changes in Mars history. We can't wait to get there and figure it all out, but it's going to take a lot of driving. You ready, Matt? Ready. Let's do it. All right, so that's our lead rover driver and our uh, um, uh, deputy project scientist. Um, and this is just to show you exactly um, how this happens. Uh, you can see that the middle wheel here is actually resting on this rock. It's not touching the surface of Mars at all. So um, it's, uh, it's, it's something that we counter a lot. And uh, this is uh, basically um, all of the mollies that we take um, uh, when we're looking for the wheel damage um, goes into a mosaic that looks like this. So it's kind of like, you know, bending over and, you know, looking between your legs with a camera. So it's... Uh, um, Stuff to do a lot. Okay, so we've gone through the good, the bad, and the ugly. What is, uh, what is coming up next? What's next for MSL? So we are, this is actually a really exciting part of the mission because we have just reached the formation, the, the, the bedrock that Mount Sharp was formed on. Um, this is a little bit out of date. We're actually right here. Um, it is Sol 759 on Mars right now, and uh, I think we are actually executing a drill as we speak on Mars. Um, so we should be getting that data down anytime. Um, we still need to drive uh, a little bit to get to the clay and the sulfate layers, but we've still got a lot more exploring to do. Um, and the team's really excited about it. We're hoping that um, the, uh, uh, we have a lot more exciting discoveries to make, um, even better than the Yellowknife Bay ones. So, uh, and this is where we're going. This is, uh, this is one of the best pictures we have for the mission so far. These are the layers of Mount Sharp. So um, thanks, for, uh, thanks for listening, and I'm happy to answer any questions that you have. We thank you, Dr. Lichtenberg. We have time for questions, and I'm sure that there's certain, uh, certainly a lot of questions that could be asked. Uh, do we have some questions that would like to be entertained at this time? Yes, Patrick. When you say prolonged periods of running water, define prolonged. Um, probably millions of years. Just millions. Yeah. Maybe not all in this area, but kind of over the surface of Mars. Some of them are and some of them are not. Um, uh, if you'll notice, uh, the sky doesn't look quite as red here as you expect. Um, we have calibration colors on the rover that we know what those look like under Earth light. And so pretty much every time we take an image, we also look at the calibration colors. And so we can subtract out the Mars light and that's what we've done in this type of image. So this is what the scene would look like if we were here on Earth and we were looking at it under Earth light. So some of them are, some of them are not. What's the weight on Earth and the weight on Mars? I'm so What's glad the you time asked. delay that you can send a command and get it back? Um, so uh, the weight on Mars is about a third of, um, actually, yes, a third of what it is on Earth. I get confused between Moon and Mars and third and six, but it is a third. Um, um, the time delay uh, between Mars and Earth um, varies between the one time. So if we send something here, um, and it, it would take anywhere between three and 22 minutes to get to Mars. And then of course there is the return delay as well. So really the fastest we can send and get information back to and from the rover is six to 44 minutes, depending on how, where the, the planets are and their orbits around the sun. Yes. <sighs> there are there are exploration techniques that we can't you do with a robot. I mean, there are things that we can kind of see. We humans are a lot more mobile. We I don't know if you realize it, but this this rover drives really slowly. We we traded speed for torque so we could get over. Um, um, over rocks, so we can't actually explore very far with robotic things. Um, if we had humans on the surface, we could probably explore a much wider area. Um, 
other than that, I'm not sure that there really is that much benefit. <laughs> we can do better science, yes. You're welcome. So this mountain you're going up, it has some exposed, an exposed side. What caused the exposed side? Was it erosion or a crater or? Um, that's a good question. I don't actually know the answer to that. I, I, I could find out for you and get back to you if you want. Well, another question. Yes. Uh, so the, the north, as I understand it, the southern islands and northern plain, both, both plains. Mm -hmm. The reason, uh, so the question is, there's the, the northern, um, the northern lowlands and the southern highlands. If you look at a, a, um, a map of Mars where you kind of are looking at the the, the terrain around it, it's very smooth in the northern ha northern half. It's very kind of rocky and hilly in the southern half. Um, the reason that the northern half doesn't get very much uh, attention is that we don't see any evidence of hydrated minerals. And since kind of the driver for exploring Mars is also to kind of explore how life could have originated on Earth and, and where it could have originated on Earth. Um, that's why there's not so much of excitement, uh, you know, focus on the northern plains. Um, for volcanologists, um, it could be an, an interesting place to, to go look. Um, there's a lot of basalt there. So uh, the question was, uh, what was the, what's the reason, rationale behind choosing the RTG? This is actually a nuclear power source. Um, it's just generally radioactive decay. Um, it's, not, it's not fusion or fission, it's just kind of radioactive decay, but that's, they get confused. Um, the reason that we went with uh, an RTG over solar panels is that um, even though we've had great success with Opportunity and Spirit with the solar panels, it's really dependent on um, the environmental conditions. And it is, um, you're kind of always at the mercy of uh, dust storms um, that could kill your rover because you can't get sunlight down to the solar panels to power it. With the RTG, we don't have to worry about that. Um, we have a source of power. Yes, it's going to essentially slowly decrease um, as we go, but we should you know, have plenty of power to run the rover for 20, 30 years, as long as all the, all the pieces keep working that long. Right back here in the corner. So the um, yellow light phase is showing that there, there is the condition where there could have been life on Mars. What additional science goals are you interested in at Mount Sharp? That's a really good question. So the question is, um, we found a habitable environment in Yellowknife Bay. What are we uh, looking for in Mount Sharp? What are, what, are, what are the additional goals of going to Mount Sharp? So we found the habitable environment in Gale Crater, um, but that is a very uh, localized um, area, and we don't really know where that fits in in the timeline of Mars's history. Whereas with Mount Sharp, um, we pretty much know when those layers get deposited. So we kind of know where those fit in in the era of Mars's climate history. So it's really uh, Mount Sharp, the, the data that we get there, um, is to locate um, what we find there in terms of Mars's global history. Oh, very good. Um, uh, there is the question of seismic activity on Mars. Um, we don't have seismometers on Rover, and we have not sent seismometers to the surface of Mars since Viking, um, because basically we discovered with Viking that they just got triggered by wind. Um, the next rover that, or the next lander that we're going to be sending is InSight, uh, which is actually going to deploy seismometers and look at kind of what's happening in the interior of Mars. Um, so we, this rover can drive up to slopes, um, if it's bedrock, up to 30 degrees. Um, the only limitation is really, um, you know, how long we have before things break down. We can keep driving as long as we want, as long as there's a, there's a, a path wide enough um, and slopes that are 30 degrees or less. Um, and we can, we can drill up on the side of a rock as well if, if we need to. And how much does the rover weigh? Oh, I just 
afraid somebody was going to ask that. I actually don't know. <laughs> <laughs> So it depends on what you mean by life of a rover. Um, well, look at the, uh, and I shouldn't say rover. Uh, uh, the rovers, went, one of them was operating like it was, you know, it was a 90 day project and it's gone far beyond its life. Do you expect that with Curiosity? So the question is um, what is the kind of life expectancy for Curiosity? Um, and um, what have we had to adjust that based on what we've seen for things like the wheels? Um, NASA pretty much likes to say, okay, we don't, you know, as long as the prime mission gets completed, we consider the mission a success. And anything above that is gravy. So we've actually already passed that point. Um, that was uh, actually in July of this year, yep. Now, if you talk to any scientist or engineer in the mission, we fully anticipate, you know, pending, you know, nothing catastrophic happening, that we're going to be driving this rover on the surface of Mars for years to come. Um, now, granted uh, that wheel damage has made us revise how we drive the rover, but if you remember, the, um, the, the parts of the wheels that are getting damaged aren't the load-bearing parts. Um, it's the material that's kind of there to keep rocks from sand from going into the middle of the wheel. Um, there is another concern in that the aluminum is getting bent inward and we have a whole bunch of cables that we need to drive the actuator and we're a little bit worried that, you know, if we get a big enough gash and the aluminum is getting bent in too far, it could actually interfere with the cables and so we really want to avoid that. Um, but even if there were no material uh, left uh, surrounding the grousers, we could still drive on bedrock just fine. So I don't see that really limiting our, um, our driving ability long term. Uh, you mean uh, kind of in a the, the W shape? Oh, the rectangles, excellent. Yeah, let's go here. So I don't know if you noticed in the wheel testing, uh, some of the wheels um, the, in the video that I showed, some of the wheels had JPL written on them. Um, that was our original wheel design and NASA said, you can't put JPL on the surface of Mars. And so <laughs> JPL engineers went, okay. And so we do need holes. Um, these are actually uh, part of how we mark odometry on the planet. These make impressions as we're driving and we use those to kind of figure out, I mean, we have um, uh, uh, inertial measurement units in the body of the rover that we also use, but this is kind of a calibration. Um, and it also allows stuff to fall out of the um, uh, rover uh, if it gets kind of in, in the middle. Um, but if you'll notice, I don't know if anyone um, knows Morse code, but this spells JPL. <laughs> I'm sorry, could you repeat your question? Um, it depends on how it fails. Um, so basically, we cannot jettison a wheel. Um, if, if, one of them, uh, if one of the actuators stops working, so the, the drive actuator, um, we, we are able to um, make it a free rotating wheel. So we can drive with the other five and just let, let that one kind of freely rotate, which is something we couldn't do on Spirit and Opportunity. Um, when Opportunity lost uh, its right front wheel, um, that was not allowed to freely rotate. And so we basically had to either push it or drag it behind us. You had a question right there. to know the answer to this. Um, it, is, uh, it is not wet lubricant, it's dry lubricant um, because of the temperature swings on Mars. Um, I don't know the answer to that. I'm going to have to look into that for you. Okay, I think we have time for two more questions right here. Uh, are you in touch with the space agency in India? 
Yes, uh, as far as I know, yes, they, we, we have to be because uh, the way that we uh, talk to all of the spacecraft that are outside of Earth's orbit, um, or outside of uh, kind of orbiting Earth, rather, um, is through the deep space network that NASA uh, runs. So basically, India has had to coordinate the deep space network time um, to get all the data back from the India orbiter. Yes, yes, I know, they got there, it's great, it's really exciting. So. We have a question right here. Yes, uh, one of the, the fun things about space exploration and NASA's history is the clever use of material. Once you get it into space, you only have this rover. What have been some of the clever uses that were unforeseen during the design phase that now that you've been on Mars for a year or so, uh, that you've been able to play and learn your rover? Um, a lot of that comes from um, necessity being the mother of invention. Luckily, we have not had too much stuff go wrong with this rover, so we have not had to come up with creative ways to use things in different ways they were intended. But there is something that uh, we did a couple months ago that I, I had to cut out of my talk because it was too long. But um, uh, we, So we've got the ChemCam instrument, which is the, the laser, the Pew Pew laser that just basically creates a plasma flash and looks at the spectra coming off of it. Um, we we uh, have recorded that on Earth. We have a you know we have engineering models of all the instruments, so we can see the plasma flash here on Earth. But we've never seen it on Mars. And the, the ChemCam instrument team is like, we just we want to know that we want to see what it looks like on Mars. We've never seen it. So um, it took a couple months of uh, coordination and working between the two teams, but. Um, the, uh, we basically took the arm out um, and took a movie with the Molly camera while we were uh, lasering a rock, and we could actually see the plasma flash from it. So that is something we didn't anticipate doing until we actually got on the surface and we're like, hey, this is actually something we can do. And you know, the, the PIs, the principal investigators, which are the people who are in charge of, um, there's one for each instrument, they both agreed to it and uh, I've got one final question. Could you describe a typical day when you're part of the upload team of what transpires? Absolutely. So we're not on Mars time anymore, um, which most of the people on the team like. There are a couple of people who actually really uh, adjust well to Mars time, but that's a whole different story. Um, <laughs> they're actually night people. Night people adjust to Mars time really well. And my fiance was a night person, and he loved Mars time. Um, so uh, a typical day is, um, we come into work, um, and the rover, basically, the, the, uh, the, the rover has sent data to the orbiter. The orbiter has sent it to us, and we take a look at that data, data um, which is uh, one team of instruments. We call them the downlink team. So downlink is data that's coming down from the rover to Earth. So downlink. Uplink is when we are sending commands from the Earth, commands or other stuff, from the Earth to the rover. Um, so I'm, I actually been on both the downlink and the uplink teams, but um, the downlink team analyzes the data that's come down from the rover, assesses the health and safety, says, okay, this is what we had planned to do on the rover on this day. Did it all compute, complete successfully? Is there any, anything out of the ordinary that we're looking at? Anything that would um, you know, keep us from doing certain activities that we wanna do next? If the answer is uh, no, everything looks fine, then the uplink team gets to work and says, okay, science team, uh, what do you want to do with the rubber today? And the science team, all 400 of them go, okay, we want to do this. Um, so then we have science representatives um, that are, you know, kind of shifts rotate each day. And we have, you know, the engineering team at JPL. Um, and there are, you know, engineering activities that we need to do for the rover as well. So we basically have to mesh the science and the engineering activities, make sure that they all fit. Um, you know, we have enough energy to do them all. We can get all the data back through the orbiter that we need to, you know, plan the next day. Um, get it all figured out, send up a day's worth of activities to the rover, and then go home and go to sleep. Well, we thank Dr. Nixon. Thank you. Thank you.